Oh, actually, maybe leave it on us for now, and then um, okay. I just wanted to swap around something on the agenda. I don't know if you got that email, Chris, but um, I didn't actually do that. Um, oh, you don't need to. I just thought during the meeting we could say, "Could we?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that's what I was expecting you to do. Yeah, here. perfect. Okay. All right. Um, welcome everybody to the January nineteenth, uh, two thousand twenty-one zoning subcommittee and Amherst Planning Board joint meeting. Um, it's 5.03 um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law GL C30A18. This meeting of the zoning subcommittee and planning board is being conducted via remote participation. And oh yeah, so I have to um, do roll call and I'm not going to mute people. So if you guys could just, you know, either mute yourselves if it's going to be noisy or just leave it unmuted and don't talk until you know it's your turn or whatever um because it was too too unwieldy to keep muting and unmuting so um i'll just go down the list uh andrew mcdougall present uh doug marshall present janet mcgowan here and tom long present and me maria chow present um and then we have with us ben Brager and Chris Bursup of the planning department. Um, we'll so start off. Maria, yeah. I just noticed that Rob Mora is in the attendees. Oh, okay. So why don't you bring him over as a panelist and then if we have questions, he can respond to them. Perfect. Okay, thanks for doing that, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, first item announcements in minutes. Uh, Andrew graciously volunteered to do the first set of minutes. Um, I volunteered to do them. I still have to do them. Okay. No. I do have, yeah, no, I did the template and also uh, thank Pam for shooting over the Zoom too. So okay. should have it for next go round. Okay. And so do we have a volunteer for today's uh, zoning subcommittee meeting minute as, a, as far as a minute speaker? Um, I know Andrew used the transcript. Did that help? Yeah, I mean, to the extent that you need to refresh your memory, it's yeah. it's super handy because it'll identify the person who's talking with their comments. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. You don't need to look at the video. If You can just sort of use the audio transcript of it. But. Okay. So, yeah, any volunteers for that? Volunteers, singular. <laughs> Thank you. Was that a yes, Janet, your giggle? <laughs> that was my nervous. No, Tom's using his hand. Oh, you was? I, oh, okay. Yes, yes. Physical hand. Oh, okay. Sorry, Tom. I was watching. Perfect. All right. Yep. I'll give it a stab. See how it goes. Okay. Yeah. Short and sweet. That's all we need for zoning subcommittee. Um, any announcements? I guess that's from you, Chris. I can't think of anything except that there are going to be bells ringing at 530. So if you hear something, I guess I'll mute myself. It's probably right. in honor of Martin Luther King. That's my guess. So. I think it's for the COVID for all the people who have passed oh. last year um, in a sort of memoriam. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. I'm glad you knew that, Maria. Uh, let's see. Public comment. Anyone in the public attendees who have a comment about items not on the agenda for tonight? Um, I see there are four people. Oh, I have to say who they are. Is that right? You don't have to unless they uh -huh. want to talk. Oh, okay. But, oh, maybe they wanted to know who the other people are. That's right. Last okay. time they said, we want to know who else is out there. Okay. Uh, we are happy to have Kathy Schoen, Hilda Greenbaum, Jack Jemsek, and Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see no hands. And I will try to stop the meeting early to make sure, because last meeting, um, Normally, as only stuff can be, we're kind of casual about it, and usually we let the public like put in their two cents about what they heard. And last meeting, I adjourned before I did that, and so um, a couple of people actually gave really good points at the end. So I'll try to stop early and let that happen. Um, okay. So uh, something I wanted to do for item number three, zoning parties, is switch the order of some of the things. I wanted to put C first because I know Chris has been meeting with uh, more and. Uh, Paul Brockelman um, trying to get the um, work plan organized. And so I thought that would be a good thing to have at the beginning. So we could kind of see what our work ahead looks like and then dive into item A, B, and 
D after that. Um, does that sound good, Chris? Yeah. Do you want me to go through it? Or just a quick summary, or at least give us an idea of like what the work plan might look like. I know All you're right. still working on it. If Ben could put up the motion list that the town council voted on, just to remind ourselves of what was on that list. Oh, yeah. Um, do, do, do. I can pull that up in a second. That was, sorry, I didn't have that up immediately, but let me um, find that. About 50 files that we've been sent. Yeah. I have it. I could share it. Oh, hey, I could. I could. Yeah, this will be a good practice, Chris. <laughs> All righty. Let's see here. Um, where is it? Where did it go? I I do have it now. Oh, you, you do have it. All right. I failed at my practice. <laughs> it is. So yeah, here is the list of motions. Oh no, this is something, is this This a, is it, yeah. no, this yeah. is it, yeah. Okay. So go down, um, action item two, number two, um, zoning priorities. So the town manager has been asked by the, or directed by the um, town council to ask uh, staff and um, others to present to town council on by May, March 15th, um, the following items, um, adding BL district to footnote B, adding footnote A to the maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage, uh, proposing a revised sp supplemental dwelling unit bylaw, similar to the one that was proposed in 2018, um, uh, submit the demolition delay bylaw revisions, which is essentially rewriting the demolition delay bylaw and then taking it out of zoning and putting it into the general bylaw. Um, working with the council to begin a conversation on housing types, um, moving apartments to site plan review in more zoning districts, removing footnote M, which relates to the general residence district and relates to um, additional lot area that's required per dwelling unit and revising the apartments definition. So I won't go into the ones that they've asked for by September 1st, but if Ben can bring up the work plan now, mm -hmm. um, that would be helpful. And so this is in, in an Excel format here, yep. So this is a draft work plan and um, it's something that the uh, town manager suggested that we put together. And I, it's a draft because I haven't really, um, I met with the town manager this afternoon and he made some suggestions about adding and moving things around a bit, but this is what we have to date. So the idea is that, um, well, the zoning subcommittee is very, um, how can I say this? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very energetic and interested in working on this project. So um, the plan is that you would meet pretty much every week until um, mid-March to try to get this work done. Um, so what, what I've got here is times for the zoning subcommittee to meet, and those are um, in that top list that Ben is showing now with his cursor. And then I have um, times for the planning board and the CRC to meet together, and that's on the second tier down, starting with February 3rd. Um, and then I have um, pure planning board or pure CRC meetings, which is on the third or fourth tier down there. Yeah, so we can go through um, kind of week by week and what, what we're expecting. So we're in week three right now. Um, we, week one was the week when the town council voted to have this list of zoning priorities. And last week we met and we talked about the priorities. And this week, week three, um, January 19th, and we're beginning to work on the um, BL, business limited zoning district and adding it to footnote B. Um, tomorrow night, we'll be presenting this draft work plan to the planning board. So that's what you see down below where it says PB meeting, and then it says one slash 20, present draft work plan. So the next week, which is um, week four, we would have um, the planning board and zoning subcommittee meeting on Tuesday the 26th 
and begin work on remove footnote M. And as I said before, footnote M has to do with um, ex additional lot area per dwelling unit in the general residence district. Um, that same week, actually that same day, um, I would present the draft work plan to the CRC meeting and they meet during the day, they meet around two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, then we go to February and um, we have week one in February and there's a planning board and zoning subcommittee meeting on February 2nd, Tuesday. And then we would begin work on revising the uh, supplemental dwelling unit bylaw. And we would also um, ask Ben and, and Rob Mora to present the draft demo delay bylaw. Um, we're pretty far with that, but we haven't quite finished it. This is something that the Historical Commission is, has been working on. Uh, and I think that, um, that's how many weeks is that from now? Two weeks? So we should have a pretty good draft of that by, uh, by week one of February. Um, then later on that week, we would have the, the planning board meeting and the planning board is going to hold a joint meeting with the CRC that night. Um, and they're gonna have an update and check in on progress on zoning amendments. And I've asked Rob to uh, present his work on um, the recodification project. Ben has done a lot of work on that with Rob's input um, to the extent that we have reformatted the zoning bylaw, but we haven't um, yet really started to put much of substance into it. But um, he would be able to, Rob will be able to explain to you the, the reformatting effort and how uh, zoning amendments will be put in there going forward. And we'll also present um, to the planning board and the CRC that night the draft demo delay bylaw. Um, and then depending on how much the planning board and CRC talk about these things at their joint meeting, we may have additional discussion at the planning board meeting. So that's what the next box is about. Um, then in February week two, we would begin to draft um, moving apartments to site plan review in, in more districts. Right now, apartments are allowed by site plan review in the general business district, but they're not allowed anywhere else by site plan review. They require a special permit. So um, that's one of the things that the town council has asked us to work on. Um, that same week, uh, actually that same day, Tuesday, we would present um, to the CRC uh, what we've come up with so far for the three draft zoning amendments that we worked on for the previous three weeks, the BL to footnote B, removing footnote M and revising the supplementary dwelling bylaw. And that same week, I've been asked to meet with um, residents of district two, um, which is actually my district, Pat DeAngelis and uh, Lynn Griesmer um, have invited me to come and talk about zoning to their district meeting. And I don't, I haven't been to a district meeting before, so I don't really know how it works. I don't know if they televise it or broadcast it or how they, how they manage it, but I'll find out more about that as time goes on. So that's on the 11th, which is, what day is that? That's Thursday, Thursday, the 11th of February. And I understand that all of the districts are gonna wanna have presentations about um, the zoning amendments that we're working on, but, they haven't scheduled them yet. Um, so in week three of February, um, the Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee will meet on the 16th and work on adding footnote A to maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage. This is one that I'm, um, I have my, what should I say, reservations. That's a good term for it. I have my reservations about this one. Um, and there, I think uh, we're all going to learn a lot about it as we move forward with it. And it may end up being a good idea. There may be reasons why we don't want to do that. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to say that up front. Um, it doesn't really say where that would occur. Is that only going to occur in the BL zoning district or is it going to occur all over town? I don't really know. So, so that's another thing that we'll have to figure out about that one. Um, and then on Wednesday of that week, we would present to the planning board um, what we've got so far with the 
uh, new and revised drafts of the zoning bylaw. Um, week four of February, um, the zoning subcommittee would work on revising the definition of apartments. We found that to be fairly troubling. Um, apartments are limited to 24 dwelling units and only 50% of them can be of any one size of the apartments. Um, so that same week, the zoning subcommittee meets on Tuesday. The CRC meeting will also be Tuesday afternoon and we would present and discuss the new and revised drafts of the zoning bylaw with the CRC that afternoon. Um, then the first week in March, um, I'm thinking that would be devoted to, for the zoning subcommittee, reviewing and refining what they've come up with, what you have come up with as far as, as draft zoning amendments. You would probably wanna do that two weeks in a row before you actually went to the um, town council with these things. I've learned today that, um, that we may be, um, there may be some flexibility in that date of March 15th, but I have to kind of work on that a bit. Um, so in other words, we may have more time than we have shown in this, um, in this draft work plan here. And then uh, we would also be, during those two weeks, week one and week two, we would be presenting um, what we've been working on to the joint, a joint meeting of the CRC and the planning board. And we'd be discussing how to present it to the town council. At some time along here, we're gonna have to submit these documents, these drafts to our uh, town attorney to get um, a blessing from him that these meet the requirements of the state law. And, um, and then right now we're expected to have these in format to present to town council on March 15th. But as I said, um, we may have some flexibility in that date and I will give you more information about that as we move forward. Um, the town manager has also uh, encouraged us to um, include more about the recodification project in this uh, work plan here. So I've added that in red down below, as you can see. And he's also encouraged us to add some of the planning department um, priorities for zoning amendments. So I haven't done that yet, but um, the next time you see this, I'm hoping that I will have had an opportunity to do that. Um, so, uh, I guess that's all I have to say right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Rob, um, may, uh, maybe Rob Mara has something to say about this because he was in the meeting with the town manager this afternoon. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. I just want to get a sense of how set in stone this number of one, six or seven items we're going to cover before the 15th is. Is that really the plan that we're going to work on this many? I think initially we thought we could take on three, but it looks like it's all of the items. Um, so I think what we're asked to do is to um, get back to the town manager with a plan about how, how many things we can actually work on. Yeah. And one thing that he suggested was that um, there, was, there was something on the, on the, um, the motion sheet from town council that was called work with town council to begin a conversation on housing types expansion in preparation for other zoning amendments that would be coming along in the fall. Okay. And um, so the town manager suggested that some of these things on apartments might be rolled into that conversation so that we may not actually have drafts of, um, of something to present to town council on either moving apartments to, the, to site plan review in more districts or revising the apartment definition. That may be something that we talk about, but it actually comes up later. And then um, the other thing is I said, I, I have reservations about the changes to footnote A, so I'm not sure exactly what that's going to contain. So there is an opportunity to um, move things around a bit and to perhaps coalesce some things together and we, me and you, can uh, have our input into how much of this we can actually accomplish. So that's probably something that we 
could talk about today. I mean, in the end, um, how can I say this? The town manager is asking me to put forth these proposals to town council. I am very pleased to have you and the planning board um, help me to put these things together and air them out to the public so that we have some sense of what does the public think of this, rather than just me going to the town council and saying, here you go, here are some things that I think need to be done. So this is a good public process. So I think you should be um, involved in the decision about exactly what we think we can accomplish in this time frame. Um, the other thing is that, as I said, there may be some flexibility with March 15th and whether we could actually extend the time to sometime in April or May. So what are okay. your thoughts? Yeah, because when I, I first saw a previous draft of this, I kind of was, you know, almost had a heart attack. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> but, um, but then uh, I think we emailed back and forth. The, the, the idea is that the planning department would be doing most of the draft reports the zoning yeah. subcommittee would help in whatever capacity as far as research um, uh, studies and bringing you know more questions and ideas um, but that you know that made me feel a little better because I thought um, I don't think this is <laughs> feasible but I I, I maybe um, Rob if you want to Rob more if you want to um, talk more about what you know as far as um, what Paul might be thinking as far as the amount of items that we should be <clears throat> shooting for as a goal, because uh, personally, I, I I don't have a good sense from the planning department how much you can take on, but I think it's too much. Um, but I just, uh, it'd be, yeah, I'd like to hear if Rob, you have anything to add, and then we can see if other members want to weigh in on the amount of work ahead and whether it's realistic. Um, do I have to unmute or? I think you. Um, no, hi. Um, yeah. So I think Chris covered it pretty well, but um, you know, I think we've been having the same conversations as recent as you know, maybe an hour and a half ago about <laughs> how much work all of this is. Uh, but I'll, I'll, you know, my takeaway from the most recent conversation conversations uh, is that you know the expectation is that uh, if we are able to focus on BL and mm -hmm. M listed in your weeks three and four uh, work, that's really a high priority. Of course, you know, we'll learn as we get into it how these other items interact with each other. But uh, I think it's, um, I think we're all sharing the same opinion that all of these items is a, a large task in the time frame, And, uh, you know, uh, focusing on BLM is uh, certainly the priority from what we understood earlier today. Okay, good. That sounds good. Um, any other member have anything to chime in before we sort of get into the BO as far as um, this work plan and um, well one item is uh, uh, kind of administrative um, Tom you'd said that you could meet at 5 30 and not at 5 moving forward on Tuesdays is that correct yeah that's correct and typically we have faculty meetings which are going to be every other Tuesday until 5 30 so I feel like it'd be more consistent if we just did it at 5 30 but um, I'm happy to Join a half hour late every other week, whatever you know really works best. Um, you know, if, uh, it's not mm -hmm. it's not that big of a deal, but it should only be about thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you, how do other members feel? Just sort of chime in, like if you prefer the five to six thirty or five thirty to seven. That I, this is this is the second week in a row. I have a seven o'clock Zoom meeting also, mm -hmm. so I prefer the earlier time. Mm -hmm. Janet, do you have a preference? I'm fine. I'm fine either way. Andrew, I'd like to pick a time everybody could be there so we can have, you know, yeah. continuous thinking. Yeah, I agree. Andrew, do you have a? Uh, I'm generally better for earlier just to try to get get the day done, uh -huh. um, so I can move over to making meals for people and stuff. Um, Here, do you but <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, I, I, we have to pick. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Tom, maybe what we can do is on the days you're late, um, you know, not start with something. If you're studying a particular topic, we'll push that to like item three or something like that. Does that sound? Totally. Yeah, okay. and, right. and there's a pretty good chance that these these can be done by five fifteen, and I'll just transfer. Oh. Gears. I'll just I'll just make it a priority to to shift gears as soon as I can. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay, so we'll keep the five or six thirty. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Maria. Mm. Can I, I have a kind of a question about the work plan is, and I, I'm sort of, I'm just, so 
is so the goal is for the planning department to present all of these zoning bylaw changes in the first section to the you're going to draft it up and write it up and just present them right is that is that is there any and what are we doing kind of thing are we just doing some analysis because um i mean it seems it's, it seems like a task in itself just to draft up the zoning changes they've asked for it seems like a huge task to um analyze each one and figure out what the best draft would look like or maybe there's a recommendation that it's not a great idea so i don't so i i can't i'm trying to think of what we're going to do like i don't think we could talk about the bl you know tonight and then be like talking about a final draft and you know what i mean i just i think this is an enormous yeah. amount of work so and, i think that um well I the way I, I saw it, you know, we've got some data on BL, we'll discuss tonight. And then because of this work plan I saw and how it was moving to other topics, I thought that we could break off some people stay on BL, we'll start to, you know, get a foothold on the next topic. Maybe some of us volunteer to study it. And then, you know, we kind of break, like, I think you had a suggestion, we start to break into groups as far as who studies what, but initially we all sort of dive into one topic together to sort of understand, you know, what's involved and what the implications are, why we're studying it. Um, but I'm kind of hoping some of these things drop off because I agree uh, by week four, there's like six things up in the air. And so it sounded like from Chris, you were saying, you know, some of the things will move to later and maybe March 15th will move. But, but that was my idea is like, you know, as we talk about each topic, Chris will tell us what would be great things to know or study, or we can come up with those things and um, I, yeah, I don't know if, as far as drafting the reports, maybe Chris or Rob, you can talk about that aspect as far as what the planning department would do. But I was really looking to Chris to tell us, you know, um, if there are areas we can study or what kind of thing would be useful to study. But, um, but for but like, for example, for this first one, Doug, Doug and I took it on ourselves to just study the topic in certain ways. Um, and Andrew gave us the base information, which was great. So I mean, I think BL footnote B would be a good test of like how far we can get on an item tonight, you know, just get into it and start discussing it um, and then see if we yeah. want to start to touch on footnote M and then next week, you know, some people stay on BL, some people focus more on footnote M. So may I say something? Yes, like, please. Can I, throw, can I throw one more thing in? The other thing I, I'm really concerned about is, you know, you have a list and we're just working our way down but adding BL to footnote B is, you know, would be really affected by adding footnote A to maximum lot coverage and building coverage. And that is in all districts, according to Kathy Shane, who had asked about it. And then removing, you know, removing footnote M, there's like five other changes that would dramatically affect what goes on in the RG. So how is that conversation going to go when... You know, well, we can only take one item at a time. I don't know that we can sort of suddenly, you know, if we're so focused on one thing to think at, uh, on a topic that's four weeks down, I mean, sure, they influence each other, but I think what we're trying to do is take it in bites because otherwise yeah. we won't move forward at all. So I guess, I guess I'm just very worried about the quickness of the biting. You know? <laughs> and I, yeah, well, I think we have the same concern, basically, that this is right. a lot in a too little time. Mm -hmm. but we'll see how right. it goes. Yeah. I think we're going to be circling back. You know, yeah. we'll keep circling back on what we've done previously. We don't have to have the final drafts until the last few weeks. And if the idea is that the town manager is actually going to present these to town council. And then the town council will decide, oh, well, we want to refer this to, town, uh, to CRC and the planning board. And we want you to hold a public hearing by X date. So they're going to give us some guidance as to how this is going to work going forward but it's the town manager who's being asked to present these to town council. I'm viewing myself as a person who coordinates all of this, probably does all of the drafting of the bylaw amendments themselves, looks to my staff in the planning department, as well as members of the zoning subcommittee who are willing and skilled to um, help with graphics or research or comments or whatever. And this is also a good, um, vetting mechanism. Um, it's a public meeting 
and we have members of the public listening to this, I suspect there are probably some town council meeting uh, member, town, town council members who are going to come in and out of these meetings. So they'll get a flavor of what some of the issues are. So rather than just me sitting in my room and typing things up and then boom, hand, handing them to the town manager to give to town council, this is a, um, a, a vetting process and that it's going to take, I don't know how many weeks we've got, maybe six weeks, but I think it's going to be really useful to hear what are the upsides and downsides of a lot of these things that are being proposed? Because we don't really know yet because we haven't really studied them. So mm -hmm. that's my view of things. Okay. Yeah, I think we're here to help support that study aspect. I don't expect we're going to be writing any reports. So um, if that sounds good, and if anyone else has any issues about the work plan, I'd like to actually get right into um, item A, uh, the, the BL footnote B study that um, a few of us did. But, may I yeah, say I one to... more? May I say yeah, one more absolutely. thing before we get into that, which yeah, is yeah. that there's been some concern about writing reports, and the reports won't actually come until after the planning board holds a public hearing on any of these things. So between now and March 15th, we will not need to write reports. We'll just need to come up with text for the zoning amendment, and then whatever backup and research and pros and cons we can present to town council along with the text. And then later on, after the public hearing, we'll write the, the planning board report to town council. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, um, I lost my participants thing. Uh, yeah, does that sound good? We'll get right into item A now. Um, ben, can you make our... I, I think Doug, you had wanted to like move around some of the diagrams with your mouse so we could just talk through what we did. Does Doug need to be made a co-host or can he just share a screen? I think he can share a screen. Oh, okay. Um, Doug, do you wanna, I have the, I think I sent you the email, the PDF where it has all of our diagrams. Um, we could just sort of set up what we studied and then show it. You know, Diagram by diagram, does that make sense? Yeah, that's it. Um, do I need to unmute you, Doug, or? Let's see. Okay, I'm on, now I'm unmuted? Oh, yeah, now you're good. All right, and you can see the screen here? Yep, you can see your mouse moving, yep. All right, Maria, do you want to start with this, or do you want to? Let's start with the easier one because that one's the weird parcels, I feel like. Let's start okay. with like the one and more in the center. Like, yeah, either this one or the next one. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, let's see, this is mine. So um, at first I'm just gonna go through what Doug's calculations and my calculations. What we did was we first took just the existing and showed it with existing setbacks. Um, and then, right, that one. And then the next calculation we did to the right of that is if there was no residential, what can happen right now, as the code says for BL. And then the lower left, we said right now, what can happen for residential as is. And, um, and then the lower, oh, I said, sorry, I said the lower left, the lower right is um, say we do add BL to footnote B, what happens? And um, we did this as max build out. We really put on our accountant hat or mathematician hat and not our architect hat, um, just to get the numbers and crunch them and see what was possible. So, um, Does everyone so know what we're looking at here? Like, do they, are they oriented to this location? Maybe okay. you could say something about where this is. Sure, sure. So um, this is the BL that's right by Kendrick Park. Um, Doug's circling it right now. Um, Oh, I can't remember the names of the roads, <laughs> but um, Kendrick is that sort of V-shaped empty space there. And then um, what uh, Andrew also sent was like a really interesting thing about the owners of the different parcels. And uh, it was mm -hmm. interesting how um, I think it was the ones I marked B, C, D, E, F, G. Most of those are owned. Oh, wait, it's the one below it, the, the block down. Most of those are owned by one property owner. Was that right, Andrew? I think that was right. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah that that's right. And then on the upper block, I think three lots were owned by one owner. I think it was like B, B, and F maybe, but they weren't as 
you know, together. But um, what was revealing about this study, and Doug can talk about what he studied, but I did it by parcel and um, put all the setbacks on. And what BL allows is only 35% lot coverage. So actually BL is pretty well known for exactly for these size lots with the 35% coverage. It's kind of a, like everyone calls BL transitional. It's not suburban in that there's not a lot of pavement everywhere. And um, so this square footage lot um, seemed like what BL was designed for. Um, unfortunately, as far as residential, you can see in the lower left, it does not allow any residential right now. Only really parcel K allows one unit. J, I'm not sure because the square footage on the assessor's page does not match what uh, is drawn, but J seemed like you could have one. So clearly that's the flaw in the BL zoning. But as far as sort of um, density and urban planning, the numbers seem to work. Maybe Doug found out something different. But the lower right shows well, it. Well, I guess I'd comment on this. Yeah. Uh, first of all, in the upper left, it's interesting to me how many existing structures are non-compliant with the setbacks. I think all of them are non-compliant, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, the sort of urban pattern that uh, maybe people like is to have the, the structures out closer to the street because so many of these houses are in fact quite close to the street and don't have the setback. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then I guess in the lower right um, or even the upper right, um, you know, the side yard setbacks of 20 feet from the lot line creates 40 feet between structures. And uh, that to me is, is uh, you know, the buildings are objects in the landscape as opposed to creating a uniform street edge. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I could kind of see how that might be a good transitional approach, but I think I think that's worth talking about, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, and whether, you know, whether if if we really want, uh, or if the town really needs to to build more housing, should the housing it builds continue to be in this kind of quasi suburban setback uh, regimen, or should it be a little more urban, with a stronger street edge and less and less distance between buildings? Mm -hmm. So that, that to me is a question that was raised by, by what Maria did here. Right, right. And it was interesting also when we studied the different areas of BL, the Triangle Street parcels are really different than the parcels here that are more central. So yeah. you can see in the lower right, um, if we do move to BL, and it's kind of hard to tell from the calculations, but um, basically the bottom row of that chart shows um, if you had a three-story building, which is allowed in BL, um, you could have, you know, for example, parcel A can have 12 units. Um, B and C could still have, they still are too small to build any residential, but the low, the highest number shows as if um, there are three stories for each of those structures. So clearly um, that does loosen up the ability to bring residential as far as um, that aspect. And um, so what yeah, size, what size units were you using? Do you remember Doug? Yeah, yeah. What I drew, and I think you continued to use, was I did. Chris. We used the same one thousand square foot okay. distance uh, area that you used in your memo from twenty sixteen, mm -hmm. uh, and the box that I drew was twenty five by forty, and um, you know, I think I think that's really big for you know an apartment. Um, kind of as a typical, but but I just thought that's where I'd start with the same numbers you used. Um, I, I guess I I also kind of question whether whether the number of units in an apartment building is really relevant to what we're doing. Um, I may have said this last week, but you know, like when I look at an apartment building, I just look at whether it's well maintained and whether the size and scale of it is appropriate. Um, I'm not sure I really care how many units are in it. Um, and, although, you know, I can imagine that the, the primary implication for units is 
does it how much parking might it generate in terms of demand if you figure you know there's so many spaces one or more per unit of per apartment unit um, so should we um, make a decision about what size apartments we're going to be uh, using? I believe that, you know, some people are saying, well, um, you know, the apartments at, um, what's his name, Amir's place, I think they're like 600 square feet. And some of the apartments on Spring Street are 350 square feet. So do we want to come down from the thousand square feet and be more, um, more in keeping with what the average size apartment is mm -hmm. in town? Um, or do we want to stick with a thousand square feet just to be uniform and then have people, you know, kind of bring up this point again and again? Um, what, what's the a thousand to account for common area as well though? That's right. Yeah, when Doug drew his designs, we just figured um, we're not designing, we're just trying to crank, crunch the numbers. And that accounts for like elevator circulation stairs that we didn't draw in. Um, but I actually, I have to uh, say something. I actually did reduce these to 800 for this, uh, this diagram. So that's a little confusing because for the others, I kept it at 1000. But for this one, I actually couldn't fit that um, diagram rectangle that you started with Doug. So I actually made them smaller so I could even get any units. So I think that's right. As long as we're consistent, then we can compare, but I, I couldn't fit the thousand square foot and have a corridor, you know, for these parcels. So um, I guess what, what, what we wanted to show with the diagrams though was just sort of numbers right now and not think too deeply about, um, you know, streetscape and design. We're just trying to see what the BL allows now and what it could allow and um, so. Can we, um, in terms of what can it, it would allow, it seems to me that if um, one landowner owns four parcels and combine them, so then- that's what Doug's gonna get into next. Okay, okay. yeah, okay. Why don't, well, then why don't we go to the second yeah. one yeah. for this area? Mm -hmm. so, so my assumption, I, I started with assuming that in every case, all of the parcels were combined because I wanted to, sort of see what the maximum build out could be, uh, whether you call that worst case or just maximum, uh, probably depends on your perspective. Um, so for this area, you know, this is quite similar to what, it's probably identical in, in the upper left to what Maria showed. I did add uh, One East Pleasant and the block that has Xana and the toy box mm -hmm. uh, to my diagrams just for scale comparison. Mm -hmm. All right, and then uh, I, uh, my diagrams use the, uh, have the same, have the square footage that's the same calculation over here for the 35% buildable area. But I drew the kind of existing non-residential scenario as a deeper footprint because it's probably offices or retail. So those are the blocks that would be available conceptually if you just combined all the lots in each block. Now then in the lower left, um, with the calculations we did, um, Lot C is not buildable, it's too small. Lot D could have um, a maximum of 11 units. So what I drew was a third of that on one floor, assuming it was a three-story structure. You know, obviously if, so there's a total of 11 units they could be 11 units on one story or six units and five, five units on two stories or 11 units, you know, or four units on three stories. Why was it 11 instead of 12? Well, because you start with 20,000 square feet, you remove from 62,000, that leaves you 42,000, you divide that by four, thousand per unit 
gives you another 10. You add that to the initial one and you get 11. Thank you. And then I assumed that the footprint would be the, I'd round up and then, you know, the odd unit would, would drop out on the third floor. So that's how, you know, lot D and lot E here are labeled and shown. And then if you took footnote B away, uh, it's sort of a reverse calculation because, um, <clears throat> Let's see, okay, with, with footnote B added to BL, basically you have the same square footage allowed in footprint as, as uh, if it were non-residential, but if you have a, a shallower building that is a double loaded corridor with apartments, it could be something like I've shown here, just I made the assumption you'd wanna hug the street edge rather than set it back from the street. And then I just uh, saw how many of those thousand square foot blocks I could fit into that footprint. And so obviously if we made them 600 square foot unit sizes, the number of units would go up significantly uh, in this case. All right, so what you showed Doug tells me if this scenario ever happens, you know, where all the parcels turn to one lot, is, is what you show in the lower right considered transitional or is it considered more, you know, I know everyone says Amherst is not urban, but I'm just saying it as an adjective. It's, it's, this is a more urban response to the street, what you've shown in the lower right. What I, yeah, and the other thing that, you know, kind of parallel with what Maria said, that we had our accountant hats on rather than our architects hats. Um, you know, that's a really, that's a lot E, that's a really long street, that's a long face of a building. Mm -hmm. I don't think any architect would really do that. You would either, you would, you'd set back somewhere once or twice in the, in the uh, facade and break down the mass of the building. So I hope this doesn't get construed as gee, we're gonna create inhumane buildings. Right, right. Doug, yeah, are, I'm sorry, so is this also 800 square foot dwelling units or is it thousand? No, I used thousands consistently okay, okay. throughout. So mm -hmm. if, if the units were like 450 each, you could just multiply by three for each of those if they were- No, five, you'd multiply by two. I'm sorry. But if you just, if you shrink, I'm sorry, thank you. But if you shrink them, you can, you can say multiply by two or you shrink them more, it could be multiplied by three. So there's a lot of flexibility in there. And then, yeah. and there would be no, okay. And so. Yeah. And if they were, if they were micro units, you know, with uh, essentially studios, you could probably triple it. Yeah. Which is Spring or, Street. Or more. Is like, like Spring Street has a lot of very small units. So Doug, could you go back up to that previous sheet? So looking at, um, we should have put them side to side, maybe that big. So, oh, uh, down to um, the same. So see how the lower right diagram I showed, that is with the BL moving into footnote B. And so that's what we're sort of trying to uh, vet right now is like, you know, this is probably what would happen for the, block A through G, but then what Doug showed might happen for block H through L. Um, I, I, with the exception that, yeah, no architect would build a 500 foot long building. But, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out is this shift from BL to B a first step at a f way to fix BL? Um, maybe we can look at the other areas of downtown before we sort of, but, but I just wanna make sure we're focusing on like, that's, that's what we're here trying to figure out. And um, so just sort of keep the lower right diagram in mind as we move through these studies. Okay, I also wanted to make a point, which is that as the units get smaller, there are fewer people who can live in them. So even mm -hmm. though our bylaw says that four people could live in a studio apartment, that's not realistic. So if you have a studio apartment, you're probably going to have one person. If you have a thousand square foot apartment, you may have two. Just keep those things in mind. Right. Mm -hmm. If we if we're interested in having families, we're, you know, the larger unit size is yeah. much more 
conducive to that. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Maria, you want to go south from here? Sure, that's fine. Um, okay, so the, 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 uh, the second area was south of Amity Street. This is Amity Street here. Town, I think that's Town Hall there. Mm -hmm. Um, so Amherst College starts right in here. This is a parcel owned by Amherst College, but only the northern half of it is in the BL district. And uh, this is Hitchcock Hall here. So the, Maria, you want to talk about this yeah. one? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the same idea. Upper left is existing conditions with existing setbacks. And like Doug said, um, the lowest parcel T is half in BL and half out. And then the one um, Doug's highlighting, or sorry, okay, yeah, that one uh, is if we only put, um, we put buildings with no residential at all. Current bylaw allows that much coverage as far as, 35% uh, coverage and um, no residential in the lower left shows that only parcels R and T um, can put any residential and the number is I mean, like one unit for R and six for T if it were three stories. And then, um, and uh, yeah, those sorry. charts. Yes, Janet. I, I just, I need to be oriented. So could we, um... Or one of those buildings is the People's Bank, right? Like one's a parking no, lot. That's, on, um, that's not on the study. It's in the corner. Oh. Okay, I'm lost then. <laughs> no, o is, o is People's Bank. R is the P and R, the, the parking lots for the Bank of America and the, right. uh, the town parking lot. Sorry, I thought you said Bank of America. I, no, no, no. Yeah. So, okay. So we're, okay. So the, that this, includes. This is, this is People's Bank here. Yeah. This is part of the Amherst Cinema. Okay. And this is Hitchcock Hall of Amherst College. And the, where's that gray building that sits on the high hill? Is that, that little is that, that, that That's it there. Okay. Oh, that big one. Oh. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Um, and so the lower right diagram is the one that shows if BL went into footnote B. Um, you, let's see, what did my calculation say? You could basically have three units on parcel O, 15 on P, and these I think are the thousand square foot units. It was just that middle block I think that I couldn't fit, but um, yeah, I, I should, I should, I should have kept it consistent rather than trying to cram more units in, but I think these are the thousand. I have to check my channel. Um, but again, <laughs> yeah, it does relax the, you know, like, I don't think T would ever happen, but you could get 24 units on three floors. Um, uh, S, you could get 18. R, you could get 18. And P, you could get 15. So it does, you know, open it up to more residential. However, it has that issue Doug brought up about. It's a little more suburban. There's 40 feet between buildings, but maybe that is appropriate for transitional. So it's, it's um, maybe it's a massing study we needed to do next. Um, Realistically speaking, though, really only S would be developed, in my opinion, because um, T is owned by Amherst College, right. R is the parking lot for um, the bank, yeah. and the two O's are um, the People's Bank, and P is owned by the town, so that's not going to oh, be right. developed um, to uh, apartments in the mm -hmm. near future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And R even includes part of the... Uh, Part of the cinema, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. yeah. So then I did a sim. You know, I did kind of the same thing I did before. Uh, what if what if all of the parcels got combined, including the half that's owned by Amherst College? That's kind of the big footprint you could put on the combined parcel as a as a commercial building. That is the footprint of a three story building with the what is it, maybe 21 units that would be allowed currently on a parcel of that size. And then this is kind of the maximum build out you could do. And that was 29 units at a thousand square feet each on each of three floors, which would yield 87 units. Obviously you would never, Amherst College probably would never sell that parcel and they certainly wouldn't let you get so close to Hitchcock Hall 
but uh, so that was sort of the worst case. Should we go to the third one? Sure, yeah. This is fascinating. It was for me too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so again, same thing, upper left, oh, sorry, I'll orient everybody. Uh, this is the, um, you can see Kendrick on that map is that big open white space. Um, U is where Bank of America's little kiosk is. V is where, um, I forget, it's like a liquor store, a pizza joint. I can't remember anything. Insurance. Number. Yeah. Um, and a bank, a couple, a couple of banks. Oh, really? Okay. There's two That's drive right. throughs right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And what's W? Is that, uh, I really can't remember. That's a medical, kind of medical and skin doctor and uh, the Boys and Girls Club there is there at the north end. Okay. And then this is the dentist's office. Okay, all right. And the high school is just beyond, yeah. Right. Okay, so again, yeah, upper left shows existing setbacks. Um, and then the weird thing about these three parcels is uh, there are only two of them, well, three of them are partially in BL and not. So um, yeah, that's the actual BL zone, but the parcel goes beyond, yeah. Um, upper right is if there is no residential, what's the max build out? And that's what it would probably be about. Um, X, I forgot to fill in, but you can imagine a really odd shape working with those setbacks, maybe if you're Hadid or something. Um, and then lower <laughs> left, um, let's see, I wrote the number of units. So under current zoning, U could have two units, V19 and W5. And X, again, you could, if you made a building that shape, you could probably squeeze two in there. So, um, oh, actually, no, you probably can't because you don't have the 4,000 additional per unit. So maybe that's why I left it out. So the lower right is the one. That's the one if we brought BL into footnote B. Um, taking a more urban uh, stance about, you know, like what Dave was saying, addressing the street, putting parking behind, and then the numbers ended up, you could have 72 units on U, oh, sorry, seven, 72 on V, which is a center large um, parcel, 18 on U and 30 on W. And that's assuming three floors. And those are the thousand square foot units. Okay, that was my question. Um, yeah. and. Um, okay. So you can see, you know, with these larger size parcels and with the studies Doug did, it's a much more urban sort of response as far as if we move BL into B for this area versus, you know, the more central parcels, which are a lot smaller. Um, you know, it seems like what was the 35% coverage was really meant for small, smaller parcels. If it was meant to be like a transition zone, this feels not, like a transition zone zoning. So um, I, yeah, maybe after we go through Doug's, people can speak up as far as what their opinions are about that. But that was what I found revealed to me doing these studies. Um, and yeah, Doug, if you wanna show what you. Okay, again, um, you know, the existing deeper footprints with the parcels all combined smaller footprints, assuming three stories with the number of units available. So there were approximately, there were 26 units available on this parcel and eight units available on this parcel. And then if you remove or, or you add footnote B, um, you know, this gets again to be really large scale, you wouldn't do that, but uh, the number of units kind of gets gets up to, you know, pretty substantial. And those are a thousand square feet apartments, right? So it yeah. could, if they were 500, that would be 290. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. That's, a lot of, that's a lot of people or a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. You might even be able to support a grocery store downtown. Or, you know, find a place to park. So, so I, I, I understand Maria's point and I, I have to like add, um, the dull and legal, legalistic cautionary tale about how well footnoted the BL is. So the height could be an extra story. Um, you know, if we're waiving maximum lot coverage, it can get a lot bigger. Um, I for, I've forgotten, I, mean, I could kind of go through all the BL footnotes. Um, we could add stories, we could add height, we could, I've forgotten, let's see. Chris, can I ask one question of Chris that, that 
uh, when I started looking at this and I look at table three, under the BL, I already see a footnote B under basic minimum lot area and basic minimum lot frontage. And Maria and I assumed that was sort of a, a mistake because Does it make you know, when you go to the footnote, it doesn't mention BL at all. But yeah. uh, Chris, do you know why that's there and has persisted? Um, I think it's because the BL used to be combined with COM and it's possible that the footnote was never removed, but I think there's a more subtle reason and it's not coming to my mind right now. Maybe Rob Mora can um, explain that if he's still here. Mm, he, he's got everything turned off, so I don't know. Rob is not here? Well, he's, well, he's, he's, he's here. Rob's here? Yeah. Well, I mean, he's He's connected. here. So he's let's connected. ask him to let's ask him to answer that question, Rob. Maybe he's having his dinner. <laughs> yeah, he might have left. Well, I'm just wondering. So um, it's six o'clock. We haven't touched footnote M. Uh, what are members' thoughts on, you know, should we should we continue to study the BL and B like should Doug and I continue to study this, or does anyone else understand this well enough that they see a question you would like to study, and then we dive well, in? The, Maria, you know? we also, I think Janet had agreed to look at alternatives to. Yes. Oh, so yeah. oh right, right, right. Yes. So it seems to me that um, um, this is a big change from the existing zoning, and um, I think it would be important to study the impacts, and so you know, yes, maybe people, it will support a grocery store, but what are the impacts on people next door to, you know, so many more units or parking, which obviously is a hot topic um, and things like that. So I think that I agree with Maria that we're sort of losing the idea of it as a tra transitional zone. And at the same time, the original zoning seems very constricting. And so, you know, the, the you know, like what are the options? And the options are we could keep the BL and change that to 20,000, square feet for one unit or and then change the 4,000 square feet for additional units. So we could shrink that. And so maybe we get more units, but not so many more units or, mm -hmm. you know, this, this might be pushing the BL really into a residential zone and away from a commercial zone. And we might want those buildings for, you know, for, for professional buildings and things like that. And so I think that one question well, I had was, can we, you know, we could play with those numbers. I'm not, I mean, you guys have a, you know, so, you know, that would be an a, a thing I'd ask you to look at is what if you just reduce the 20,000 square foot requirement for the first unit and shrank it down and, and just didn't get quite the intensity. But I did ask Pam Rooney to look at changing um, the BL to um, business village center or village center business. I always get it confused. And it did have a more, it had an increase in, cause it's a more flexible zoning. Um, so it did have, it did produce a lot more units but not quite so many. And then also she looked at turning um, it into BN neighborhood business, which also- Can you also, read what the numbers were for that? Cause I didn't have time to read that, but what did- Yeah, they so um, she did just the cottage street thing. And then she okay. used, she combined, cause there's only like two people I think who own property there. And so okay. she combined them. And Chris, can you pull that up or- or do you have of you, Janet, and can just read it because um. You oh, you mean pull up, pull up Pam Rooney's um yeah. write up. Okay. I think Ben has it. Oh, okay. Or if yeah. you have it in front of you, just read it out loud. Um, yeah. Well, I'm trying to. I'm 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 flailing through this. Oh, here we go for Cottage Street. I it. Yeah, she she did she uh, used I think the full part the full lot area rather than just the area of the lot that's in the BL. Okay. Doug, you're muted. No, I'm not. No, he's not. Oh, he's not. Oh, his lips were moving, but I couldn't hear him. That's because of the uh, the lag. Oh, okay. So I should probably just turn off my video. <laughs> so one thing you could consider is, um, and this we did in the B, when we created the BN, which is right in the vicinity of where um, the Emerson Media Building is, 
Um, that was actually created by the planning board and then, or by the zoning subcommittee and then the planning board and then town meeting um, agreed with it. You came up with a new zoning district that fit that situation exactly. Um, I would be reluctant to recommend rezoning the areas around the general business district as business village center because they're not a village center. They're a village center is something else. It's something away from downtown. These areas are near the downtown. So we should come up with something that makes sense for areas that are near the downtown. And I understand what Janet is getting at, that BVC may have um, dimensional requirements that make sense here. Yeah. But maybe you want to come up with another zone that makes sense and uses the same dimensional requirements as BBC. So that's that's another option to consider. So, I, you know, the question I have always, you know, you know, I, I was deep in the weeds on all these charts and I just thought, what do we want to have there? You know, we want to, you know, we want to have a transition zone. We don't want to go five stories next to a, you know, a single family house or, you know, a two story house with, you know, three rental units. So I think what we need to do is say, what do we want there? And then build the zoning around that. And also, you know, being the, the effect of the footnotes, I, you know, I would love to, you know, if we're going to go with this BL thing, I think we need to sort of strip off some footnotes so people will be reassured that it's not going to be a four or five story building. Um, and they aren't design standards. There's no control of what the building will look like, you know, except for us on a given day or a given panel. And so I think if we knew what we were trying to achieve, then we can just we can just write the code to meet that. So, well, Janet, I, I'd like to come back to something you said last week, which was that uh, students are not a protected class, and therefore we could we could zone an area of town exclusively for students is kind of what I take from that. So I guess since you know since. Uh, it seems like a lot of the issues that we have in town are because there's such high student demand. One approach we could take would be to pick an area of town and zone it for students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you could, you know, obviously the students are mostly coming, going to school at UMass. So you, you could pick an area near UMass to do that. Or you could, you know, or you could say, well, some of those areas are near existing neighborhoods, so, gee, we'll do it down in South Amherst. Um, well, there has so, a, people have suggested University Drive as sort of a student village, and an, they, in the in the housing production the market study, they talk about having a a student overlay district, and where you're really just planning around the people that are going to be there, so. That has that university drive thing has been batted around for years. Um, you know, if you if you did well, South, so if you picked South Amherst, you could say, yeah, then we'd have to have great busing and try to figure out the impacts on you know surrounding neighborhoods and stuff like that. University Drive has the advantage of not really having that many neighbors, except for the um, Center for Extended Care and the Arbors, which obviously would have to be thought about. I'd like to try to keep it back on what we're studying about the BL and whether footnote B is a right fix or if there's a different fix. Um, I wonder if anyone has ideas on next studies for this so that, um, I don't I don't wanna volunteer you, Doug, but I mean, maybe we keep, since this is in our head, we studied a, a different, whether it's square footage for a minimum lot or if it's um, setbacks or if it's additional lot per unit. Um, or maybe should we do it offline and move on to uh, 3611? I was uh, hoping we got at least moved on footnote M so we could, you know, get that started with some other members as far as doing some, you know, gathering information about that. But it might be a little too complicated to get too far in the next 15 minutes. What do you think, Chris? I think it's better to stick with the BL and just yeah. try to go farther with that. And then maybe oh, at the yeah. very end, someone will say, I'm willing to research um, footnote M, whoever that might be. And then I could work with them. Yeah, cause that, okay, because that's why I thought the work plan was a little ambitious having you know just one meeting per topic. I feel like, yeah, if we can sort of go through this, maybe a two to three meetings, that'd be great. So um, well, um, one quick comment, I think, yeah. um, 
is that I think I heard both Doug and Janet talk about this kind of reverse engineering um, and that there's somewhat of a, a problematic state of these, these island buildings being generated in the center of these smaller lots, creating these 40 foot gaps between buildings and all kinds of, let's call them, maybe not wanted consequences of some of the scaling and some of the proportions of these. So I'm wondering if there is a way in which if, you know, as Janet's saying, there's an in-between, um, what does that in-between look like? And is it possible that there are other implications to that in terms of frontage versus, you know, side lots or an adjustment of zoning to accommodate that so that the side lot setback is smaller than the frontage mm -hmm. or something. That. Anyway, just thinking about other variations on that that give us a more desirable result. Um, mm -hmm. And also, like you know, you know, the thirty-five percent lot coverage requirement is, you know, they, obviously you could say that could be parking or green space, but it could be, you know, a good, you know, it could, those things serve purposes that will help the tenants and help the town or the, the look of it too. So I, I agree that somehow we have to figure out what we want there and play with that in a nice way. Um, is this all, are all these BLs in the no parking district? Chris, I can't remember. These, these three are, okay. I believe, yeah. Chris, uh, is, are, would you be allowed by zoning to put a maximum size on a building or a footprint? You'd have to do it via, lot, via building coverage. In other words, okay. Okay. how much of the lot are you covering with a building? All right. So you can't just make a specific dictate that the you know the building footprint shall not exceed twenty five thousand square feet. I don't think so, but that may be a question to ask Rob. You know, I mean, it seems to me that if we wanted to try to prevent any of these mega blocks from getting developed in that way, but still have smaller setbacks you know, in some dimensions that some way of limiting the size of the building might be useful. Mm -hmm. Doug, I think that the apartment thing where you're limited to like, you know, 24 units, I always forget the number, and um, per building, and then the lot coverage, the building coverage is maybe a, another way of trying to get at that in a weird way. But I see what you're saying. It's like, if you just thought, let's just not make the building too big and we're not so concerned about what's in it kind of thing. Well, I was, I mean, I guess I'm not sharing, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, but I was a little, I was pretty surprised to see that some of the footprints that I ended up drawing were bigger than One East Pleasant. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and One East Pleasant seemed to me to be about as big as you'd want to get. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, with yeah. the, with the town kind of the way it's headed. Um, and are you saying you'd be more comfortable on the same lot with smaller, a few smaller buildings? Well, and I, I guess I was also looking for potentially how would you induce owners not to combine into mega mega sites? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and one way is to say, you know, there's no payoff. You could yeah. probably do it with um, design guidelines, but we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, yeah. Like well, I want. Yeah, I did wonder also. You know, I mentioned. You know, you, you wouldn't build a 500 foot front facade. You'd just set it back here and there and break down the mass, mm -hmm. which made me think. Well, maybe it's time to start with just a few pages of a design guideline, yeah, tailored to the BL, and then we add to it over the years. Yeah, yeah. I've always, <laughs> I've always thought that the BL was really. Um, sort of an incongruous beast because it's in odd locations like at the corner of um, Dickinson Street and Route 9, which is Amherst College property that's being used as a parking lot and a, mm. you know, kind of a, like a facilities building. So it's there and it's along University Drive um, and it doesn't seem to have anything at all to do with the downtown. It's really a highway strip type of zoning where you can have a big building with a lot of parking and it doesn't really allow for much, um, well, in residential use unless you have a really big parcel. So I 
I kind of like the idea of looking at what do we want there and then creating a zoning district that would do what we want. And I think that, you know, based on previous experience with creation of the BN zoning district, I think that it's possible to do that. So mm -hmm. why don't we think of that as opposed to just accepting the BL lock, stock and barrel and trying right. to make it fit. Okay. So That's maybe Ma good. Maria, maybe we should, we should look at that. Yeah, yeah, because uh, we'll, we would just leave BL as is for those two other areas of town, but then yeah. do a special one just for those three areas of downtown. Yeah, I like that idea me. because um, yeah, these studies kind of show it's not ideal, but what we have now obviously isn't working. So there's a somewhere in between. So I guess offline, Doug and I can work on that. We don't need to discuss at this meeting and we'll bring something back. That sounds good. Okay. Do we want to ask the audience if they have questions or comments? Well, I was going to um, try to do that at the very end. Um, oh. Let's see if um, so. We didn't get to footnote M. Maybe for next week, that's our first item on the agenda, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, we don't spend too much time on the BL diagrams again. Well, Maria. Yeah. Wouldn't it be worth taking three minutes to see if anybody wants to volunteer to start looking at it and give us an introduction next time or something or not? Uh. Yeah, if anyone's that brave, I mean, it was hard enough to get a minute taker, so. <laughs> um, I have to even remind myself what footnote M was. Uh, I did send you a draft of, um, of a change. I sent you the table three, and I sent you the footnotes with M crossed out, and the M's in the table crossed out, but that's as far as I got. But it only relates to the RG, the General Residence Zoning District, and I say only, you know, not really meaning that because RG is huge. Yeah. So it has to apply to that whole area. RG is mostly around the downtown. If you look at the zoning map, it's a big area of yellow mm -hmm. that goes, you know, from like, I don't know, Sunset Avenue all the way to the railroad tracks. It's really huge. So um, we have to think of it in, in that mm -hmm. way. But footnote M yeah. requires be... oh, sorry, go ahead. an extra 4,000 square feet of lot area. Um, for each dwelling unit, which is right. which is a lot. So so Chris, uh, for next week, maybe someone could just bring a summary of it and ideas, not necessarily as much, you know, obviously Doug and I were architects, we can draw. So, I mean, maybe if someone volunteers just to give the rest of the group, um, you, you know, a little bit more information about it so that they have it in their head and maybe can take it and hit the ground running with it. Could I, could I make a suggestion of maybe a site visit to the BLs and to, um, I, I can never, the, the, where the, the um, Christine, what was it, the, the development that, the building that led to the footnote M on High Street? Is it on High Street? Spruce, so, Spruce Ridge. Spruce Ridge. Like, what if we just went and met and walked around the BL, three BLs, and then Spruce Ridge and just looked at that? Because I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I think that would really, that would help me. So we could do that, except that if we did it as a normal site visit, we wouldn't be able to have any conversation. If we <laughs> did it as um, a public meeting, we'd have to stick to um, public uh, infrastructure. We couldn't go on private property because the public would have to be invited and they can only come on uh, public property. So we can do that. It's a little complicated, but... Um, we could make it. I, I frankly, I don't have the time to do that. I have like a one day, like Doug and I worked on this, like on like Friday night and Sunday afternoon. I don't think I can uh, manage it, but um, Janet, if you want to go with one other person, I think that's allowed, right? You can have two. You can have two people go. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if, or, you know, everybody could just go on their own. I mean, yeah, I, I, I know those parcels, all of these parcels quite well. I live just near, near them all. So, well, I know what I this, we seem to have a lot of zoning some committee ahead of us, but I thought it would be a fruitful thing to sit there and talk. And I would love to pick your guys' brains, the architects' brains and the planners' mm -hmm. brains about like what would what would what would suit. You mean but, if we were doing a site visit there? Yeah. So um, we would have to say that as a public meeting, and we'd have to have you know members of the public invited, and then stick to the and sidewalks, sidewalks, yeah, and, I, and and I'm thinking this is problematic in terms of like COVID okay. because we'll be out there. It would be problematic if we were just there ourselves, yeah. being six feet apart. But if we have the public there, they're going to be 
there with us. And, and um, I think it's probably a better idea to each go there on your own and then come back and talk about it in this arena. Okay. And maybe some people take ask Tom, Tom could be my architect or something. I'll ask one of you guys to go. Cause I would love to get some good ideas. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyone volunteer for a footnote M and if not, maybe Chris, you can give a brief summary to introduce us to it and we can start a dialogue. Yes, I can do that. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, really I'll, do a quick, I'll do a quick uh, spreadsheet with using some parcel sizes because it's, it's purely a mathematical footnote. Oh, is it? Okay. You know, all you do is you take the, the lot size and divide by 4,000 and, you know, well, you're, then, pretty much, you're pretty much there. Okay. Well, maybe, Doug, if you want to do that, we can talk about what to study next and I'll do the, the grunt work of, you know, footnote B, BL stuff, whatever, you know, as far as the drafting, if you want to take on that footnote M. Okay. I can give examples of um, where footnote M has been problematic such as the Spruce Ridge um, project, which was the generator of footnote M. And then there was another property in um, the RG district. And I think it was in the vicinity of Fearing Street um, where someone proposed something and it was actually a pretty nice development, but it couldn't be built because of footnote M. So okay. um, yeah. Where is Spruce Ridge? Spruce Ridge is on High Street. It's um, if you go to the go to the railroad tracks on Main Street, and you look up and you see a new building that's going up, right right along the railroad tracks, then the next property over. In other words, um, okay. I think it's still on the same side of the railroad tracks. Yeah, it's that's to the East Ridge. East. Yeah, it backs up. It's to the east of that new building under construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I would be interested in knowing is you can look at Spruce Ridge, and I, I can't remember if it sits on an acre parcel, but when if I pictured the R, any RG lot of that size turning into Spruce Ridge throughout, you know that 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 is startling to me, and so I'd be interested in knowing, you know, what can if you took it away, it, like what is what does footnote M stop from being built, and you know if we had a bunch of spruce ridges all throughout the RG, you know, in 40 or 50 years time, that obviously would be a huge change in the neighborhood. I also know that you can increase the density in the, in the RG in many different ways. So I'm kind of like, would like to see what that looks like or understand what else can be built in the RG. Um, it's also like the district with, you know, a billion historic houses and, you know, our traditional architecture. There's not that much open space there that can be developed. It's mostly side lots. So I don't think that the effect of taking away footnote M is gonna be huge. So it could will you, be true yeah. in certain areas, but I can, I can try to study that. Yeah, figure out how many lots and things like that. Cause I think on high street or one of those side streets, there are a lot of big lots, um, but anyway. So item D, I feel like we talked about a little bit through having the work plan um, shown to us. So I want to just make sure we let the attendees speak this time with everyone present because last time I said, see you later. And then <laughs> we didn't get to hear the public. So I, um, it's not on our agenda, but um, normally we sort of open to the public. And if um, I see one hand, but I'll limit it to three minutes because after that, pretty much just wrapping up. Oh, there's now three hands. So um, I will keep time. But if yeah, I can just keep it um, to, to less than a couple minutes. Um, that would be great. We all have family and hungry stomachs. So, um, Kathy, I think your hand was up first. Uh, I think you, I can you oh, hear me. Yeah. Yes. No, okay. Yeah. I, I will speak quickly. I had a, a few thoughts. First of all, I thought it was an excellent conversation. Um, and Chris bringing my attention to BN. BN is a really interesting zone when you compare it to BL. Um, for what it allows. So a couple of comments. One, there was a question about the three areas you talked, is that in the parking overlay? So, and the answer I think was yes. So one thing to think about is should it be? So if you did anything that allowed more density, should you just redraw the parking overlay so that you have to have parking? And if you didn't do that, because we're talking about potentially a lot of cars, if you didn't do that, there are 
some areas and it's coming a little bit in Massachusetts impact fees because uh, if you remove that big parking lot where the ATM machine is, you might lose parking space. So could you do something if you're removing parking space, you pay into a kitty that you're getting money back to build a garage someplace so that we actually get money from it. Um, secondly, um, the drawings were really, I thought really useful and it would be helpful as you start looking at this to think about how wide are these roads and are there sidewalks now and how wide is the sidewalk? You know, so if we're talking about walkable, you know, we don't have any streetscapes in our zoning code, but we could. So in some codes I've seen as they move the building, new buildings, clearly the old ones, wherever they are, they stay, but the new buildings are adjusted to allow for a sidewalk if there isn't one, particularly on a narrow street. Um, to allow people to walk. Like Cottage Street right now, people walk in the street. That's, and it's easy because there aren't a lot of cars. Then um, the other, uh, there was a question about mass and we don't have it in our code, but I saw in some codes, there was a floor to area ratio. So you took the square footage of whatever the, the bottom floor was. Then if it was three more floors, you added all of those up and you could say, how much mass we are willing to allow in this particular area as a way of limiting the mass. So you could, you could do three, three skinnier floors or, three, or two wider floors, but it was a ratio. And the towns I've seen that have that is where they want a little bit more dense, it's one ratio and where they want it to be less dense, it's another ratio to stop um, the building. And Chris, I saw one reference in our zoning code, but it seemed to be not in much of our code. Um, it just isn't there. Um, then the last thought is on the, th the areas you've circled, there is quite a bit of commercial um, and we, we're losing most of it downtown. Um, and one of the reasons people want to come to a downtown urban area is there's um, an eatery, there's a bank, there's uh, small things. So the BL looks like it's got more commercial in it with a scattering of residential. And do we want to protect some of the small commercial in some way? Um, so building on top of it rather than completely displacing it. And I think residential can be more of a financial gain. So I think you, we want to worry that we lose what little we have. Um, and so just keeping that into the weighing the pros and the minuses. And I think that's it. I mean, okay. I, you know, when I looked at BN, it was interesting for use also. So looking across our zones on what can be in a BN versus a BL, um, it's just a useful, um, instead of trying to fit just to the list that was given to you, to think, to think what do we want is, I think, a good approach. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Um, Dorothy, you're next. You get two minutes. You time me in. I'll start when they, you unmute. So you're still, I don't hear anything yet. Um, yes, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, good. I think you know that somebody watching this and doesn't see names and doesn't have any um, way to unmute themselves. Um, oh, okay. I'm gonna be very brief. This was fascinating and really complicated. And I'm just hoping that I could get copies of those charts because I know it will take me a long time just to read through them, to catch the codes, to compare them and to think about them. Uh, I think it's a really um, good start in trying to understand the kind of choices that we're being presented with or may be presented with. Um, I did have a question for Doug. When you drew, and I can't tell you which chart it was, but it was like a U-shaped building that was open, the hollow place of the U was open to the back. You did that on, I think, a lower right-hand drawing. So it would be like the fourth one in one of your sheets. Um, if you reverse that and had a U-shape, kind of like, um, like you know, I, I'm thinking of a building in the, in the Bronx, with, which had a lot of apartments and it was maybe three or four stories tall, but yeah, it's, it's the, the used one here. And, but that, would, that was open from the front. If there were a building of that type where the, the whole of the U is facing the street and you could have small shops on the lower floor of that U um, and then maybe some green space um, or common space there, I could see that could be something that might be inviting and keep some of the 
um, interaction between people in town and still provide increased housing. I, I, I don't know if that's what you meant with that design or whether it was just to be parking back there. Well, I, I get, should I answer that or not? Um, oh, if it's quick, sure, go ahead. Well, I, 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 you could certainly do that. I think the other, the implication of that would be that the mass of the housing would be up against the adjacent yeah. RG district. And, uh, you know, then the neighbors would be more in the shadow of whatever's been built. That's all. Thank okay, you. Maura. See, you're muted now. So click the button one more time. Still muted. There you go. Yep. Um, I, I think what, what I wanted to say was mostly been said at all, but I was wondering if you could just change the portion of the BL that's near the downtown that we've been talking about to be in zoning instead of all the BL. That's number one. And number two, there's a limit in how many apartments can be in a building, but if it's a mixed use building, that limit doesn't apply, right? Yes. <laughs> so you could fit the 75 units or whatever in there if you just put some kind of business on the first floor. Okay. And third of all, all the businesses that I use downtown practically are in those buildings that are would be demolished and made into apartment buildings if if this all went into effect. And you know what happened with the other big buildings is all the small businesses never came back. What we have are mass mutual and um, vacant space and another and a noodle restaurant. So. I, I really think it, you know, we should think carefully before we um, just do something like that wholesale. Sure, definitely. Yeah, no, we were basically crunching numbers. We were not wearing our architect's hat, like we said. So thank you so much for um, joining and, oh, uh, did some more hands go up? No, those are the same three. Thank you so much for coming and speaking up. It was really great to hear the public. Um, and I hope you come to the next one. Um, item four, topics not reasonably anticipated. Anything, Chris? I, I don't have any topics, no, thank you. Okay, so next week um, we'll do five to 6.30 and Tom, yeah, just show up when you can. And if we have a thing for you, we'll make sure it's not at the beginning of the meeting that you have to be late to. Um, and we're adjourned. Thank you very much. This was fascinating. Thank you, yeah, That's great work. Good discussion. I'll be in touch, Doug. All right, bye-bye. Okay. Uh,